<laughs> Nearly six million dogs are newly diagnosed with cancer every year in the United States. This week, we want to talk about some exciting advances in non-invasive testing to detect cancer earlier in dogs. We've got a veterinary oncologist who is leading the fight. You do not want to miss this special episode this week on The Veterinary Viewfinder. Welcome back to The Veterinary Viewfinder, the podcast that tackles the toughest topics in veterinary medicine. And one of the tough topics that we all must face in veterinary practice is cancer diagnosis. But too often, we just diagnose it too late, limiting our treatment options and making our patient outcomes just not as good as they should be. This week, we are so excited to bring to you a veterinary oncologist who is at the forefront of early detection. And before we get into early detection, as always, I am one of your veterinary co-hosts, Dr. Ernie Ward. And I'm registered veterinary technician, Becky Mosser. And Becky, cancer is a tough topic, whether you're in veterinary practice, human practice, it doesn't matter. A part of the human condition is cancer is scary. And too often we are having to make this diagnosis in dogs and too often it's too late. Becky, what do you think whenever people say cancer diagnosis to you in veterinary practice? Well, you know, I think there's a lot of questions and i think we think unfortunately we do a lot of anthropomorphizing around cancer what we know from the human side over to our pets and what we know is the technologies are not the same the treatments are not the same and and honestly the goals are not the same right we treat cancer in humans to save life at all costs and in our pets it is truly for quality of life and in, and as much more time as we possibly can get and so i think that makes detection all the more important Oh, it really does. And this week, we are so happy to have uh, with us today a veterinary oncologist who is actually leading the fight against cancer. And she's one of the people that helped develop an early detection test, non-invasive test, and that is Dr. Andy Flory. And Dr. Andy Flory, she's a board-certified specialist in medical oncology. She graduated from the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and she did her internship at that place up north in New York called Cornell University, and then at Florida Veterinary Specialist. She has worked as an oncologist throughout the United States, but then she also went down under to Australia and then her whole life changed when a little dog named Poppy was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And so leading up to all of that, she then went on to say, hey, how can I make this better for all dogs? How can we get better cancer treatments? How can we diagnose it earlier? And so in 2019, Dr. Flory co-founded PetDX to bring non-invasive cancer detection to veterinary medicine. Since the launch of PetDX, Dr. Flory and her team have developed the Onco K9 liquid biopsy test. I'm sure you've heard of that, guys. And she's published multiple peer-reviewed articles on non-invasive cancer detection in dogs. But when she's not doing all that cancer detection, she enjoys traveling, exploring foodie destinations, snowboarding, and spending time with her husband and two very active boys, Dr. Flory. Thank you for breaking away from all of your work to spend some time with the viewfinders. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Yeah, it, it's, it's so exciting because, you know, I've been a veterinarian for a little while now, over 30 years. And, and when I first graduated, Dr. Flory, I mean, I'll be honest with you, cancer was one of those things where we were just like, uh-oh, really not a lot we could do. Perhaps, you know, if it were a, an orthopedic case or we're dealing with some kind of osteosarcoma, we might have, you know, the option to do a, a limb amputation, right? And then we had a limited array of chemo agents. But today, I mean, the game has completely changed. So I'd like to maybe start off with let's talking about how has the conversation around cancer changed in veterinary medicine? Yeah, I mean, the, the conversation around cancer as it exists today is is kind of not happening until it's kind of late. And I get it. Cancer, it's a scary topic, right? It's, it's scary to face that conversation when you're dealing with it as a veterinarian, when you're talking to your client about it. You have clients that will often say, I don't want to know. You know, that's a kind of a common pet owner response. And so it means that most cancer is not really talked about proactively. It's actually because it's being diagnosed reactively, we don't really get that chance to have that cancer conversation. So that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to you know, break that veil from the silence that is enshrouding cancer and bring it to light so that pet owners and veterinarians don't feel scared to talk about it. Because we are at this time where pet owners do want to pursue more wellness care, more senior care. 
And we really have the opportunity to kind of change this paradigm of how we talk about it. Ooh, I love that. You're right. It is about changing the paradigm because the conversation in the past was primarily reactive, very late during the course. And let's face it, a lot of the treatment options just weren't that appealing to clients. Right, right. That's absolutely true. Um, and so the problem with everything kind of not being talked about it and finding it just reactively rather than proactively is we are finding it when it's late. And once it's late, the limited, the options are limited and the time that that pet owner is going to have with their pet is limited as well. But if we can kind of shift that to finding it earlier, families are going to have more control over the situation. There's definitely going to be more options to choose from. Veterinarians are able to provide them more options and they have time to make those decisions. And Becky, you know, as a veterinary technician, I mean, oftentimes it kind of goes like this. <laughs> you know, the vet comes in, delivers some pretty hard news to the client, and then they get out of the room. <laughs> you're left behind kind of dealing with it. How do, you, how do you approach that, Becky, when you're having to confront that cancer conversation alone as a veterinary technician? I, I'm well, I don't I haven't had that experience of of approaching the conversation alone. And I wouldn't work with a veterinarian who ditched out of a room on a after a cancer diagnosis <laughs> like that. However, yeah, but, but what I do find is we do out, a lot of the emotional support of that aftermath. And a lot of times the emotional conversation comes out to the technician more than the veterinarian. Right, and right. so I think the medical questions and the medical concerns and the cancer part of it all it does happen in that veterinary conversation. But I think what they look to us for is, is my pet going to suffer? Are they suffering? Are they in pain? For some reason, I think our clients connect with our technicians more on the, all right, tell me the hard stuff of it all. Um, and so I don't know. Yeah, it, it's it, for us as technicians, I think there is a lot of emotional support that goes into it. And then even into the expectations around what treatment's going to look like and what having a pet with um, chemotherapy is going to look like. And honestly, a big part of us is it, our job is here's how you care for a pet with who is receiving chemotherapy and keeping the pet and the client safe. So I think that becomes more of our, our role. Um, but to kind of to your point, like I say it tongue in cheek, I wouldn't work for a veterinarian who drops that diagnosis and bails. But I think you're right. Like it can happen in the sense that we don't. I think we are even afraid of the emotional impact we're about to make on the client. And we don't really want to deal with the emotional impact of what they're about to go through. And so I do think we armor up for those conversations. And I do think we put up that barrier like, OK, I'm about to drop the C bomb, you know, and right. um, this is going to this. I don't want to deal with what this is going to do. Uh, and that part's really hard because we've given them a diagnosis, but we've also given them a complete emotional um, grab bag that they're now going to kind of have to sort through. Yeah. And Dr. Floyd, I guess my point was that oftentimes I think our, our clients do look to our support staff to kind of get the what's what's really going to happen. You know, is this really yeah. should, I, should I do this or whatever? And, and again, Becky, I'm with you. If, if the vet just says, oh, and Becky's going to tell you all about the cancer treatment. You know, that's no, no, no. Don't work. Don't work for that vet either. But, you know, Dr. Flory, how do you approach this from a team aspect? Right. I mean, so this conversation that we're talking about, you know, how do you how do you incorporate, you know, everybody, the veterinary technicians, the veterinarians, maybe the you know CSRs, the managers? How, how do you go about thinking in terms of let's have this conversation and it really should encompass the whole veterinary team, not just the veterinarian? Absolutely. I think that's such a good point, Becky. I mean, it, it is the whole team that is involved with that cancer conversation with the family, right? And it it starts with everybody uh, in the clinic. Everyone should be feel empowered to have that conversation of letting owners know if their pet is at risk for cancer, right? And that's kind of part of this, this idea that we have to kind of break this silence and bring this to the forefront so that we really have a movement for everyone in the clinic to be talking about cancer because there is now an option for early cancer detection and early screening, and we've never had that before. And so we really want to make owners aware. You know, when I see things like the, the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study by Morris Animal Foundation, most veterinary care teams are aware of this. Most Golden Retriever owners are aware of this. And they are just coming out with some amazing science and research. One of the most impactful, I think, is the fact that 
in that breed, in that study so far of the dogs that have died, 75% have been cancer related. That is, it's such a shocking number. And most of those are hemangiosarcoma. And hemangiosarcoma is an absolutely devastating cancer to, to go through with your pet. Most of the time those cancers are found because of bleeding. By that point, it's already very advanced. And all of a sudden the family has to make this almost split second decision. Are we going to do this life-saving surgery today? Are we going to do so, you know, blood transfusions and go to the ER and all of these things? Or are we going to have to make this really difficult decision to say goodbye today when this morning we thought our dog was fine? It is absolutely devastating. And the, the opportunity to provide awareness to golden retriever owners, it, it almost feels like a necessity to let them know that there is an option now. Yeah. And Dr. Flory, I mean, again, the, the stats are roughly a one in three dogs has a lifetime risk of developing cancer. So, I mean, you know, this is something that I, I would think more pet owners would want to know about. But Becky, I don't know if that's always the case. Well, I, it, it's funny because I think it's either like they hyper vigilantly want to know and, and that's that anxiety and that fear. And then other people deal with fear and anxiety by avoiding it and avoiding that conflict. And so for some people, I think you're right. They're just like, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Um, but I also don't think there's a lot of knowledge around early testing and knowing um, and, and getting those risk factors. Um, I think for humans, it's just kind of popping up in some places where we know about it with things like the BRCA1 gene, and we know that it's DNA testing. Um, but I don't know that people know about early cancer detection for pets. And so uh, we don't know what we don't know. And we can't look to it for that peace of mind if we don't know it exists. Yeah, so Dr. Floyd, that leads me to the next question, and that is, okay, there are people that say, I don't want to know if I have the BRCA gene. I don't want to know if I have APOE4 for Alzheimer's risk, right? How do you address that with that dog parent who says, I don't want to know if my dog is at risk for cancer? How do we handle that? I mean, here's the, here's the problem with cancer is if cancer is there, you're going to know about it eventually. So the question is, do you want to know about it now when there are options for treatment where the outcome may be better, where it may be less expensive, or do you want to sort of know about it once it's very advanced and our ability to provide that long-term control is really limited and you're kind of forced into that emergent situation, potentially even finding cancer when it's late stage or it's painful. You know, we, we talked about hemangiosarcoma and finding it only after it's ruptured and causing bleeding that is, you know, if we, if we kind of put those two um, comparisons and events side by side, even if it's a topic that's very emotional to talk about cancer in general, knowing about it sooner is always going to be better for the veterinarian, for the pet parent, and for the patient. Well, well, as a veterinary oncologist, I mean, you know, you know the wide array and scope of treatments, right? And you know that some are more successful, especially if we catch it early and begin initiating treatment early. But, you know, do you think that the general public, the general dog owning public in today's conversation, do you think that they're still ignorant to what we can do with treatment? And, and maybe that's why they're hesitant because they only think of worst case scenario, like, oh my gosh, if my dog has cancer, there's nothing I can do but euthanasia. Do, do you think we just haven't done a good enough job of explaining and educating the public in veterinary oncology treatment? I think that might be part of it, but I think it's also, Becky, you, you mentioned this, like everyone has a personal experience with cancer, right? And so what most people know about cancer is they know a person that's been through it and they know how tough it has been to go through those treatments. And you said it perfectly, like there are definitely treatments that for dogs that are um, similar to what they do in people. But a lot of what we do is different because our, our goals are different in dogs. The goal is quality of life at all times. So we design our treatments around making sure that they have a normal quality of life. Because at the end of the day, our mantra is really, let's give them the, a normal, excellent quality of life for as long as we can. That's really our goal of cancer therapy. So in some ways it's that, that pet owners may just not know that, that's, that there is a difference. But they probably also don't know that we're living in a time right now where I feel really grateful to be here because there are so many new and exciting cancer treatments. 
everything from palliative care to definitive care, there's so many options that are coming out and they're just really changing the game and how we can manage cancer. Yeah, and Becky, I'd just like to echo that because I think you did bring up a good point. I mean, I think that typically our goal, objective, our outcome desired with our cancer patients and dogs is quality of life, right? I mean, we're not saying you're going to live another decade or you're going to live a normal life expectancy. I think at least in my general practitioner experience, Dr. Flory, it's, it's like, you know, hey, we've got cancer and we know it can be devastating on quality of life and our goal is to preserve it. I mean, Becky, how can we, in at least maybe your opinion, how can we better educate the public that that's really our intent here is that if we can catch it early, not only do we have a chance of extending longevity, but more importantly, enhancing and improving and preserving quality of life. Any, any thoughts on that, Becky? I mean, I think it, it is about education and, and, and openly having these hard conversations. And I think that, you know, end of life care is a perfect example where we've really started to have conversations about what that looks like and being comfortable in the discomfort. When we, when I think about cancer and specifically um, chemotherapies, one really common thing I hear clients say is, oh, I'd never put my pet through that. I mean, they just literally, without, without questions, without asking, without any kind of backstory, they literally go to, uh, like Dr. Flory said, they think of the person that they know that lost their hair, that lost their appetite, that was, you know, skeletal remains before they ever even passed away. And, and it's so heartbreaking to see. And we all kind of have that human story. And so they see it as something we put our pets through. Mm. Um, and I think that's the real thing we have to address and the real kind of myth. Maybe, I don't know if I want to say it's a myth because it is, it is putting them through that, but that, that there's an options, right? So you know, we absolutely have the opportunity to take the pet inpatient for the day, do injectable chemotherapies. We also have pills that we can give and we have clients who are comfortable giving them at home or having a technician come by. And then it, it isn't an injection experience. It isn't what they think it is. So I think it's really like addressing that it's something you're putting them through as opposed to it's a treatment and it's a means to a, as Dr. Flory said, quality of life to the end Point. And that we aren't going to treat this cancer at all costs in hopes that we get rid of it. Because in humans, that's the goal, right? Is that we're going to eradicate the cancer and we're going to get this cancer-free diagnosis and ring the bell. We have to really let our clients know it, it's never really going to look like that for our patients. Um, so again, early cancer detection in pets is, is so much more important because it isn't a matter of getting rid of it. So getting on top of it as early as we can to slow it is the is is really our best outcomes and the part where it is worth quote unquote putting them through. All right. So Dr. Flory, uh, for those viewfinders that are listening today that have been, you know, stuck under a rock for the past couple of years, maybe just briefly explain to us what the oncocanine test does. And, you know, I mean, again, it's super advantageous for us because it's non-invasive. And I, I want to get back to why that's so important in just a second. But just give us a, a highlight, you know, give us that elevator pitch on what it does and why vets should be paying attention for those handful of vets that are listening today that just missed it. Yeah, I mean, Oncocanine is uh, it's a test called a liquid biopsy test. This is a test that detects DNA that's coming from cancer cells, and it's using a technology called next generation sequencing to find the DNA mutations that are the cause of cancer. And so what we're looking for is something called circulating tumor DNA as evidence that there's malignant tumor cells present in the body. This is a non-invasive test. We just collect a simple blood sample. Patients don't need to be fasted. You don't need to do any processing of the sample in the clinic. We use pretty high-tech tubes that stabilize the sample at room temperature for seven days. And so you just collect the sample and then either send it with your courier or through prepaid overnight mail and send it to our lab and you get a result back in about seven days. Okay, and what types of cancers are you currently screening for? Because obviously using NGS or this next generation sequencing, I mean, that means you can infinitely once you identify those mutations markers, but what are you currently testing for? So the test detects the underlying cause of cancer in a wide variety of cancers. It's truly a multi-cancer test. In the clinical validation study, it was shown to be able to detect 30 types of cancer. But when we talk about the most important cancers that we manage on a daily basis, the, what I like to call the big three, lymphoma, hemangiosarcoma, and osteosarcoma, the sensitivity or detection rate in those cancers is 85%. And in the most common cancers, we 
see and diagnose is 62% sensitivity with a really low false positive rate of 1.5%. Yeah. And again, that let's repeat that low false positive rate of 1.5%. So if it says you got it, you got it, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty strong. Yeah, absolutely. It means that, um, you know, a, a positive result, this is an indication that most likely this patient has cancer and that this would be um, an alert for you to go and look for it, to do a workup and find where is what we call the cancer signal coming from. Right. And again, Dr. Fleury, I think when these things first started coming out in the human you know, medicine uh, about a decade ago, there were so many people were worried about the false positive rates. They're saying, oh, my gosh, we're going to be frightening people and they don't really have these cancers. But that really hasn't borne out, at least in the veterinary field yet, has it? That's right. So we, you know, we did a, a real world study as well to kind of find out not, you know, we, we did the validation and that was in a group of dogs that was very much real world, meaning that they were dogs that had comorbidities. They had lipomas and skin tags and sebaceous adenomas because we really wanted it to work in the real world the same way that it did in the validation study. But we did an additional study uh, uh, to examine how veterinarians are using this in the real world. And similarly, extremely low false positive rates. So um, that was certainly a concern when this technology was first being discussed, but we are not seeing false positives as a, as a, a real big problem in veterinary medicine. Yeah. And guys, if you're not up to date on like NGS and all this genetic stuff, that's fine. There are people like me and Dr. Flory and others who are immersed in this world. And, and so for us, you know, once you realize how the technology, what we're actually doing to look at these proteins, then you go, oh, wow, of course, that's why we don't see so many false positives, because it's just a simple matter of lining up A's, G's, T's and C's. And, you know, and when they come in a certain combination, that's that. Well, let's, let's kind of fast forward this conversation just a bit, because in the past, you know, you might have a dog with a lump or bump and you were going to have to do some type of biopsy, even a fine needle aspirate back, you know, people are like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. But now that we have this non-invasive liquid biopsy, a blood test that can detect, you know, over 30 cancers early. I mean, are we obligated as a profession to talk about this? I mean, you, know, you get where I'm going with this. Like, you know, what are our responsibilities as veterinary technicians and veterinarians to tell the public that there, this test exists? Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Go ahead, Dr. Flory. No, I didn't realize it was for you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> It doesn't matter. I, I, I guess what I, my thought on it is, is, and I've said, I say this so many times, like the worst thing that can happen for us is a client comes back and says, you didn't tell me like, so I think that we have to make it clear to our clients what their options are f f before it's even maybe necessary. Like, I, I think we should be educating about what tests are available. We should be using opportunities for our social medias and for our newsletters and on our website to let our clients know what these things are. I get on a real soapbox about the way we try to educate in the clinic and in the exam room in a time where the distractions are high and the, um, the duration of attention span is low. And we seek out information when we hit up social media and we're looking for information and we're looking to retain and consume it. And so we should meet our clients where they are and use those times and tools to educate them about what opportunities are, because the fact of the matter is, is it's not just about their pet. It's because everybody knows people with pets, you know, <laughs> and we talk about our pets all the time to each other. And so when we have the opportunity to say, oh my gosh, my veterinarian was just showcasing this test that they do. Does your veterinarian do that? Maybe you should have this test. I mean, that's that's the beauty of our ability to socially network and the technology that we have. Our, our learning opportunities are quadrillion fold, you know? Yeah. Um, so we should use them. Yeah. And again, you know, Dr. Flory, I've, for 20 years, I've said the exam room is a lousy classroom. It's hard to educate, especially on something as, as complex as cancer. But let's get back to that, you know, professional obligation, requirement, duty, if you will, responsibility. Like, so now we know that 6 million cases, new cases of cancer in dogs in the U.S. this year. We know that approximately one in three have a lifetime risk of cancer. What kind of responsibility do veterinarians have to tell clients about this? I mean, should we be leading with this like in, in every adult dog, older dog? Like, like how, do you, how do you see this playing out? I mean, I think it starts with just making sure that your clients are aware which 
dogs are really at risk for cancer. And the, the two main things that increase the risk of cancer are age and breed. So we did a study recently to examine how, at what age are uh, dogs diagnosed with cancer, because that helps us to form that answer of when do we start looking for it? And we found that the average age at diagnosis was around nine years. And using some biological modeling, uh, we were able to develop a model that basically subtracts two years from when that peak incidence occurs. Because if most dogs are getting cancer at nine, you don't want to start screening at nine, you're going to miss a bunch of cases. So the recommendation is to start at the age of seven. But there are some breeds that are diagnosed earlier, probably won't surprise either of you that those are the giant breeds, but also boxers and bulldogs, and they're diagnosed actually at an average age of six. And so really starting to look for cancer at the age of four in those breeds is recommended. So letting them know, you know, hey, your dog is over this age, it, there's an increased risk of cancer, this is when we should start looking for it, but also those breeds. And I think a lot of us are aware of those high risk breeds like golden retrievers are certainly the top of that list, but flat coated retrievers and Bernese mountain dogs and giant breeds and shepherds and labs and you know Frenchies, there's a bunch of breeds that are at higher lifetime risk of cancer. And I think that it's important for veterinarians to just educate their clients and let them know. Yeah, and I can't tell you, you know, I, I'm so excited about this. I think that every senior dog age seven and above, you know, maybe five in giant breeds, should have this test. But what about frequency of testing afterwards? So let's say you do it at seven. You know, I've got my dog and I'm border terrier and she's negative. She looks good. Should I repeat it in a year, two years, never? What do you say about that? Great question. Yeah. So that, you know, that first test is a great baseline that that tells us, okay, at this point in time, we don't have evidence of a cancer signal. This is great. And so we use that then as a baseline to say, okay, every time we're coming in for a wellness exam, it's important to not just screen for the diseases that our wellness exam screen for, like kidney disease and liver disease and all of the things that we screen for with a wellness visit. It's also important to screen for cancer as well. And so adding in cancer screening to that wellness visit, it increases our ability and the numbers and types of cancers that we can de detect with the wellness visit. So I would say once a year at minimum, but twice a year if your dog is at an age where twice a year wellness visits are recommended. I love this. And two viewfinders, just be clear, this list of diseases of cancers grows over time, right? Dr. Flory, I mean, you know, our database, our understanding, our research just continues to escalate. And, and you know, right now we have a list of 30 or so, but uh, five years from now, it might be 100. I don't, I don't know, Dr. Floyd, but I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you can't just think of this as like, oh, I did a BUN and creatinine. And it was fine. It's like, this is going to, this these tests, imagine now we have a BUN plus and a BUN plus 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 and just multiple tests that are going to emerge, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing about this technology is it changes so quickly. It's just like the iPhone, right? Like the first iPhone that you got, if you used it today, you would be like, what is this? But, but now your iPhone is so advanced and it's the same thing with all technology At, over time. And it's specifically with testing more and more and thousands of dogs, we just find more cancers and we're, we're able to detect more easily as well. All right. I'm going to roll with well, I think iPhone. it's the important <laughs> The important thing we, you know, about that, <laughs> you really triggered in with the iPhone there, um, <laughs> is that, you know, like Ernie, when you're talking about BUNs and creatinines, like when we start seeing those values, the damage is done. Like those, those right. values don't change until we already have damage. And so like, this is, this is the ability to, to have that really early detection, sort of that SDMA for kidneys where it's like we're looking before that damage is there. We're looking before we're beyond treatment options. And to kind of go full circle, I think as a technician, whenever I think of cancer and the devastation, it is always those hemangiosarcoma cases where the client looks at me and says, we were playing ball this morning. Like we went on a walk this morning. Like we were fine. And I, and you're telling me surgery or euthanasia and I have minutes to decide. Right. There is just, it is, it is so hard to have a client wrap their head around that one. And it's, it's so much different than like a slow decline. And oh, guess what? Yeah, those big lymph nodes and all those things you kind of were already thinking. You know, there are some forms of cancer our clients don't see coming. And I think that's the really hard one. That's the I was fine this morning and now I'm not. Um, and so 
the important part of that is is the getting this information before damage is done like it's coming or it's present and it's it's the the signals are there but i mean by the time we see some of those bad numbers that we're looking for as proactively as we can the damage is there and now we're just trying to to be at maintenance um early detection in everything we deal with our pets is becoming it needs to become the standard and that's the conversation we want to have with our clients is we have some abilities to tell it's there and we have some abilities to tell it's coming and 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 really leaning into those yeah and that's what i'd like to follow up on that because i think this is where we saw the initial pushback on the human medical front and we're starting now to see this complaint on the vet side and that is that okay so what i see this test it says the dog might have cancer in its future, but it's perfectly happy wagging its tail, eating its food right now. So what, what do you say to those critics that say, you know, Hey, I don't want to know until it's like Becky says, told the dog, I have to make an urgent decision. I disagree with that viewfinders, but, but Dutch Floyd, how do we answer that more intelligently? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing about cancer is that if you say that you don't want to know, you're going to know about it eventually, right? And so the question is, would you rather do, I mean, for veterinarians as well, would you rather do a splenectomy when your patient is stable, you have room on your schedule to get to fit them in when it's convenient for your team and when it's convenient for your client? Or would you rather be having that, you know, Friday 5 p.m. conversation of like, you have to go to the specialty hospital right now for emergency surgery and blood transfusion, or we have to make this really unfortunate, you know, decision about euthanasia right now. That That's kind of the dichotomy that we're looking at, which, which is that early detection just has so many more options, right? If you find that splenic mass when that pet is still stable, wagging his tail and not bleeding, there are so many more options for that family to choose from there they have time to make those decisions and that feels like a luxury but it also is a sense of control having control over that conversation and that decision is so important versus that you know 5 p.m emergent situation yeah and i'll take it a little bit different to slant dr flory like for me the reason that i've had all my genome sequence and i do all these tests it's because i want to know what to look for I, right, because like there's a lot of cancers, there's a lot of things that can infect your health, both of our pet patients and of our own personal health. But I need to know where my greatest risk lies so I can then start to maybe make a lifestyle change or maybe do more vigilance for monitoring. You get where I'm going with this, right? You mentioned the splenic cancer or you know, hemangiosarcoma, but guess what? The way we, if we see a signal <laughs> in this liquid biopsy oncok 9 test, if we see an early signal, then I'm gonna say, I need to focus my attention. Maybe I need to do some additional imaging or follow-ups or whatever. It doesn't mean your dog has cancer today that needs surgery, but we need to be more attentive. Does that make sense to you? Like, I think part of the value of, of early risk assessment is to say, this is where you need to hone your, your efforts, right? Not, not maybe looking for brain cancer in that dog, but really focused on the cancer because guess what? We got a signal that says you should. So actually this, this specific test, this liquid biopsy test is an indication that there is malignant cancer in the body right now. So really, if we're going to do anything about it, we need to go after it and find it. Importantly, it's not a risk prediction test. So it's not something that we're going to have this signal and then it's just going to be something that's really worrisome that we don't know is there. This is evidence that there's something in the pet right now that the veterinarian should go and look for so that we do have that outcome of like having that opportunity to do a splenectomy when our patient is stable rather than having to do it when it's emergent and they're they're really, you know, having a severe um, impact of a hemoabdomen and things like that. Yeah, and that's a really good point because again, the dog is sitting there in the exam room, wagging its tail, eating its food. It's not down and out as Becky was describing where now we have to make this decision in minutes. It's actually, okay, we have a signal that cancer is present. You need to go investigate further. I mean, that's kind of how I would use this test. That's how I use it in my own life. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, another great use of it is that we can use it as an aid in diagnosis as well when veterinarians are suspecting cancer in a patient. Like let's say they do an ultrasound for another reason and just happen upon a mass in the spleen or a mass in the liver or a, or, or a nodule in the lung. And they're like, I, I don't know, could that be cancer? Could it be inflammation or infection? It can be used as an aid in diagnosis to confirm a suspicion. And that can be especially useful in difficult to access locations like something internally where a biopsy would be difficult. So that's another big use that we see veterinarians making use of as well. 
Ooh, I love that, Becky. That really, that makes me very happy because, yeah, you can't always just get inside that dog and say, let's take a look at that spleen. <laughs> you know, that's a, we might as well take it out if we're going to do that. So uh, how, do, how, do vets, uh, how do veterinary technicians learn more about this? I mean, do you order this online? Do you order it from a distributor, from a lab? How does this whole thing work? Yeah, I mean, there's multiple ways, actually. So um, veterinarians, veterinary teams can, can get it from us specifically from PetDX. Uh, and they can go on PetDX.com to find out more information, or it's actually available through our diagnostic distributor partners as well, which are IDEX and Antex. So if you already work with one of those labs, then you can contact them. You do need to have a specific kit because we need those high-tech tubes that stabilize the cell-free DNA, uh, but you just need to get the kits. Whichever channel you want to go through, IDEX, Antex, or PetDX Direct, then just reach out to get some kits. I love this. Becky, any final questions for Dr. Andy Flory, veterinary oncologist, before we let her go? Well, I guess I love to always ask sort of, you know, a, a top three summary. So like if you're talking to a veterinarian who is interested in offering to this client, this to their clients, sort of what is your, your, your talking points for them where you say, these are the three major things you need to know about pet DX? Yeah, I mean, I think that for uh, for veterinarians that are talking about this with clients, it's this is a test called a liquid biopsy. It's a non-invasive way to detect cancer with just a blood draw. We'll have a result back in about seven days, and that will tell us whether there's a cancer signal that is detected. It can't detect all cancers, but it can detect a lot more than we can detect on a wellness visit. And it's an additional tool that can be helpful in any cases where uh, your pet is sick and we need to try to figure out if it's cancer or something else. So this can be really valuable information that helps us decide how to proceed with the workup and whether cancer is a concern right now. Wow. I love, I love that. Guys, Dr. Andy Flory, veterinary oncologist, one of the co-founders of PetDX. You can visit them at PetDX.com. We'll have the links in the show notes. Dr. Flory, thank you so much for spending time with the viewfinders today. This has been incredibly, not only inspirational, but educational. I love it. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great to be here. Well, guys, that is it for the discussion on canine early cancer detection. And I got to tell you, Becky, this is one of those conversations that I think a lot of listeners are going to be like going, wait, what? I missed that one. This could really help us out. Oh, I think it's a, it's great. And, and, you know, if you are missing out on those things, you're probably not listening to the podcast enough. We want we try to make sure that you guys are are on the up and up about what there is out there. Um, I mean, I want to hear what your experiences are. I want to hear about those patients you've been able to help with these early detections. That's right. One in three dogs are going to be diagnosed with cancer during their lifetime. Six million new cases of cancer in dogs every year in the United States, guys. This is something we should be doing a better job with, and we can with tests like Onco K9 from Pet DX. Again, thanks to Dr. Andy Flory for joining us today and educating me and a whole lot of others, I'm guessing. Becky, if people have questions about this or suggestions or just whatever, complaints, comments, how do they reach us? Well, if you have a complaint, you know to reach out to our friends over at Vet Tech Cafe. They love to hear from you. If you've had an interesting experience with these systems, if you guys use it, I just, I, I'm, I'm interested in your experiences. Let us know over on Facebook and Instagram at Veterinary Viewfinder. You can always send us an email at veterinaryviewfinder at gmail.com. That's right, guys. We will talk to you next week. Stay safe and let's get some early cancer detection going on out there, folks. Talk to you next week. Bye. Bye.